Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one. The thinking atheist. It's not a person. It's a symbol. An idea. The population of atheists in this country is going through the roof. Rejecting faith. Pursuing knowledge. Challenging the sacred. If I tell the truth, it's because I tell the truth. Not because I put my hand on a book and made a wish. And working together for a more rational world. Take the risk of thinking for yourself. Much more happiness, truth, beauty, and wisdom will come to you that way. Assume nothing. Question everything. And start thinking. This is the Thinking Atheist Podcast. Hosted by Seth Andrews. I've been so focused lately on special guests. We've had some great ones, you know, Sarah Hader from Ex-Muslims of North America, Dr. Josh Bowen and others. And uh, I wanted to just dedicate a broadcast to our listeners and to our callers who might have something on their mind no set or specific topic, just whatever happens to happen. So that's what the broadcast is going to be today. You know, I'm all about mindless entertainment. Natalie likes to call it bubble gum for the brain. But there are times when I want to be entertained while I'm engaging with ideas. My friends, welcome to Wondrium, a streaming service that is just going to blow your Mind. Wondrium has thousands of audio and video learning experiences, a ton of compelling material, documentaries, tutorials, collections from Kino Lorber, Magellan TV, Craftsy, subjects of interest far and wide, and that includes all of my favorites from the great courses, formatted into a single site in a way that is so much better and easier than having to try to luck out with a web search. You know, with my recent interview with Dave Warnock and talking to the Final Exit Network, I've become really interested in one dream series called Getting Your Legal House in Order. Like, how do we set in stone our last wishes without drama and confusion? That's been a fantastic series on Wondrium. Join me. Experience your own mind-blowing moments with Wondrium. Right now, my listeners can get this special offer, a free month of unlimited access to their entire library. Go now to wondrium.com slash Seth to sign up today. That's W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash Seth. Wondrium.com slash Seth. I've got Laura on the switchboard. Laura, hi, you with me? I am. Hi, this is Laura from Monrovia, California. What's on your mind today? Oh my goodness, let's just say that this show has been such a comfort to me because um, in the last year, I was losing my faith during the pandemic. While I know that there were people that were probably totally into their faith, but it's it was like probably loneliest time to, to feel that I was losing my faith, but the most empowering, free experience to finally accept things and your podcast. Just having the ex-Christian point of view has been so, uh, you've guided me with how to deconvert. The other day you were talking about just like Christian high school and it being a banquet, not a prom. And there's all these little things that it's really hard to explain to people that were never involved in the church that way because it sounds so bizarre now. Like even talking about it, it's just the weirdest thing. Like, yeah, we, you couldn't dance or you couldn't do this. We couldn't watch these movies or how I literally had such PTSD from my Bible class teacher saying I wouldn't reach 18 because Jesus was coming back, that I had such, my early anxiety was caused from that. And just to be able to hear other people talk about it, like I said, this show has been just a godsend and godsend. See, you can't can't even not say things. No, 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 I got you. I get the spirit of what you're saying, and I so appreciate it. So this is group therapy, and Laura. This group therapy. It, honestly, Seth, it is. There's so many subjects and topics that everybody could talk for thousands and thousands of hours because this is truly like your father passing away. Just the way you were accepting it was, sorry, I'm going to get emotional. It was so real because 
It was the love of the father and his son who completely believed on different paths, but yet you guys loved each other. And it broke my heart to think that I hoped your dad didn't at those last moments think his son would go to hell. Like, I can't, I can't, I can't comprehend a Christian's way of thinking now because I'm coming out of it, out of this, like, trance, this, this being completely brainwashed my whole life. But I look at my fellow humans, and I love them so much. And I am a humanist, and I want the best for this whole world and planet. And it's just so comforting to know that other people think the way I do, and I'm not alone in this discovery of this freedom. I'll tell you a secret. Um, The year was 2008, 2009, and I felt the same way you did. I was thinking, well, okay, I don't buy it. Now what? And I felt really alone. And it was that that sort of spurred the creation of this community, which you know, the community really has taken over. I mean, it's it's the inertia of the thinking atheist has gone well beyond any single host, you know. But the reinforcement and the encouragement and just the community and family of the thinking atheist, the listeners and the audience members and those who participate – have done for me, I think, what it has done for you, and that is a reminder that, hey, you're you're okay and you're valid, and you're not the only one who has felt this way, and however you feel is okay. And the fact that, you know, this has been there for you on your own journey is just gives me goosebumps. It is something I've always wanted. You know, you sit there and you lived your whole, you know, childhood, young adulthood, getting there and preaching the Word and being a vessel for Christ, and I feel like you are doing the most, what would we say, Christian thing <laughs> right now. Like you are. It's, quite, it, it's so bizarre to me because the people that have got out of the church or are atheists have been the most loving, wonderful people that I've ever known. And that's the part that I feel shamed about that, like all my life in the beginning, if you weren't a believer, you weren't a good person to me. And this whole platform has literally changed everything. So you're like a preacher that's not is preaching reality, and I uh, I don't know if I'm a preacher. Let's I would take how about not a brother? Preachy, you're, you're how about an encourager? How about a friend? Let's do that. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But I totally let's I totally yes. understand the spirit of what you're saying, and I am honored and so thankful for you. You need to know this, okay? You are part of a rising tide of people who are sort of realizing that we don't need it, we don't want it. I just reposted a study that had been done. Chrissy Stroop, I think, did an article about this on religion dispatches, which speaks to this notion that religious people are happier than non-religious people and that they live more fulfilled lives than religious people. This has been the claim since forever, but it's simply not true. And you and I are I mean, we're living testaments to that. I'll bet, despite the challenges and difficulties, don't let me put words in your mouth, but I would wager that you feel better now. You're more liberated and free and more optimistic about your own future now than you ever were as a believer. Am I close? No, you are spot on. I know my calling more than I ever did. And it's all, I work with autistic kids, and that was my calling. And I found it after everything when I turned 40, and it's changed my life. And that place, we do not mention God. They're all progressives, and that was my testament right there. You just gave a lot of encouragement to all of our listeners. People are becoming liberated. Their minds are being freed. They're freeing themselves, and they are helping others to do the same. Big hug from me and from this entire community, okay? And thank you so much. Thank you, Seth. Bye. Bye. I guess if I'm going to reference the article, I should go and uh, read you at least part of the article by Dr. Chrissy Strew, published in Religion Dispatches, June the 28th. Don't believe the hype about believing. You don't need religion to be happy. Is religion good for you, full stop? Many Americans think so. And perhaps that's unsurprising. In a country where most people struggle to survive, while a wide variety of gurus, hucksters, and privileged commentators are always standing by to offer simple, 
usually individual, non-solutions to complex and usually fundamentally structural and systemic problems. But the United States is not just a country where all the pablum that's fit to print peppers the pages of legacy media outlets, whose editors, when not conservative Christians themselves, seem to be suffering from a sort of belief envy. This is also a country in which science is regularly represented as taking the side of believers, at least when it comes to well-being and mental health. Faith in a higher power is associated with health and in a positive way, a philanthropist tells us in Forbes. A therapist uses the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal to explicitly and irresponsibly exhort parents who don't believe in God or life after death to lie to their children, lest they scar their psyches, and adds, spiritual belief and practice reinforce collective kindness, empathy, gratitude, and real connection. Of course, this is simply not true of the kind of Christianity in which many Americans are raised, a kind of Christianity that fuels polarization and even insurrection, and that leaves many who are raised in it traumatized. And yet, unfortunately, the fact that much of American Christianity is harmful doesn't stop Scientific American from echoing Christianity today by claiming that a sharp increase in Internet searches for prayer during a pandemic somehow indicates that religion is the cure for what ails us. Perhaps the ultimate irony here is that according to the same Scientific American article, psychiatrists are the least likely of all physicians to be religious, a juxtaposition with which, it seems to me, neo-Freudian intellectuals could have a field day. Be that as it may, the scholarly consensus in psychology has long been that religion and spirituality are generally good for human health and well-being. But that consensus is wrong. New scholarship is exposing the biases and methodological flaws that led to the current conventional wisdom, as well as correcting the record and complicating the picture. To be clear, it is certainly not the case that religion is always harmful, a fact that must be disappointing for the ardent anti-theists among us. It is true, however, that Religious people do not generally have a better life satisfaction than atheists and non-religious people. And then she references a specific study that was put together by three researchers from the University of Cologne, Katharina Poles, Thomas Schlosser, and Detlef Fetchenhauer. And that survey essentially revealed that while there are a lot of tremendously happy and satisfied religious people, they are no more happy or satisfied on average than atheists. And life satisfaction for atheists actually improved when they did not live in a part of the world where they were sort of an outcast minority or potentially discriminated against. In other words, when they were able to connect with other atheists and be open about how they did not believe, they actually had greater life satisfaction. Their open atheism was part of their overall happiness and well-being. Anyway, the study is out there in case you'd like to go take a look at it. But this notion that religious people are automatically happier and more satisfied than the rest of us is just bogus. And of course, I've got to draw attention to that classic George Bernard Shaw quote about happiness. I mean, happiness is important, but happiness is not our measuring stick for how we determine truth. And Shaw was addressing this claim about uh, happiness among the religious or greater happiness. He said, the fact that a believer is happier than a skeptic is no more to the point than the fact that a drunken man is happier than a sober one. But of course, as Laura and I just attested to you, we weren't happier when we believed in God. In fact, we're much happier now. I've got Sister Skeptical. Is that what I call you? Yes. Hey, what's going on? Well, I am a ex-Mormon. I just got out of this really rough transition period, and I just wanted to make an observation and talk about how religious persons, they seem to gravitate towards, we love America, we love freedom, all of this, but then when you actually read any of the founding documents, nowhere in there does it talk about religious rights or religion getting involved. Matter of fact, the First Amendment says you're not supposed to, 
and they all claim to believe that. But in Utah, for example, you're not allowed to buy alcohol on Sundays, and they have just all these little obscure laws that make no sense unless you're looking at it through the lens of religion. So it's like, I just think that atheists, agnostics, skeptics everywhere need to band together and defend our freedoms and say, like, you know, we're actually the true patriots. And it seems like the more tyrannical people who are in law are actually coming from some form of religion. It's interesting to hear somebody who came out of a Mormon culture where you can't have, as I understand it, caffeinated coffee talking about freedom. You felt free as a Mormon? No. Well, they tell you that if people who say they're free but they don't follow the rules, they're actually spiritually captive. That's kind of how they spin it. But I felt like I was psychologically held hostage my entire life, and things never made sense. I was always super confused. And I just, I was never able to draw any conclusions because they always said, oh, if you pray about it, you'll get the answer. And so I would just pray for like hours on end about whatever. And there would literally be like no answer. And then I'd be like, oh, maybe it's me. Maybe I'm too wicked or I don't have the spirit or I sinned. And now the, the spirit can't communicate with me. And basically what it boils down to is it sets you up to only be dependent on your bishop, stake president in order to get guidance. And so it's a means of the church controlling people. You know, it's interesting to watch the church sell freedom under these sort of narrow guidelines of control. I looked up that Orwell quote, war is peace and freedom is slavery or something along those lines, right? I mean, there's a freedom right. narrative. The window dressing says, you're free, you're free, you're free. And the window dressing hangs on a high wall. It's literally like the Matrix. I feel like when I remember myself when I was Mormon, it's like I'm looking at an entirely different person. And I think the biggest thing, I'm doing okay. The biggest improvement I've had is my quality of sleep because I had to go to therapy for this because I kept having these dreams on repeat that I would go and I would be talking to people and they couldn't hear me. That It was as though I wasn't even there. And I would be like, eventually in this dream, it would build up that I'd be yelling at people like, don't you see me? Don't you hear me? And in therapy, what I uncovered was it was that you know, ever since I was a little kid, I was questioning this religion. I was questioning Joseph Smith, and I would be asking these questions, and they'd be like, oh, we'll just figure it out after we're dead. And so I would say, you know, I don't think I agree with that, and I would just get totally brushed off, and they'd be like, oh, you're just being influenced by Satan, all of this stuff. And so I started having these dreams where I either couldn't see in my dreams or I was not being heard, and my therapist was like, yeah, that's because you keep saying – I'm finding discrepancies in this religion and my loved ones in my support circle would not hear me when I said it. And there's no way you can leave the Mormon faith with your dignity intact. It's always because you did something, something was wrong with you, you chose bad, blah, blah, blah. So I'm out. I don't have dignity. My family absolutely does talk bad about me, but I do feel happier and more authentic. And thank you for having this channel to support, you know, all of us who are leaving. Oh, it's an honor to do it. I'd like to throw this out. Take it or leave it. Dignity is not assigned mm -hmm. by other people. I think you have dignity. You left on principle. You took a stand because you just couldn't buy it anymore. You have your dignity. Now, they can try to humiliate you. Perhaps they will cast stones and insult and shoot the messenger and all those types of things. But I see you as someone who kept your dignity and stayed true to yourself and you're living on your own terms. That to me is dignity. So give yourself that credit. You know, that's some hard stuff to do. It's gutsy and it's tough and you did it and you deserve the credit for doing it. Fair enough? Yes. Thank you. All right. Appreciate it. Thanks for calling. Thank you. I had just a chance to think about the first part of the call you know, I'm a little, actually, I resist this notion that religious people are not the true patriots. And let's say we're talking about the healthy definition of patriotism, which is, you know, you love your country. It doesn't mean you love your country more than other countries. It doesn't mean that you are a blind nationalist. You know, a patriot is prepared to criticize and acknowledge flaws and say, hey, we're far from perfect, but I love my country and I want to see it achieve its best ideals. So uh, that form, that healthy form of patriotism. But I know a lot of religious people, even devoutly religious people, who genuinely do love their country and want to do the right thing. I get the vibe, and I don't want to 
put words in her mouth, but I mean, I'm, I would assume she's talking about the theocrats, the people who have crossed over the establishment clause of the Constitution, right? Uh, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, religion a private exercise. But these Christian nation types, the ones who have stamped a brand of ownership on the country and everything that's good, you know, I'm, I'm sure uh, I know what she's talking about there. But to be fair, I mean, I know some atheists who hate this country and who are far from patriots. And, you know, they have a, they have a right to do that. And I know a lot of devoutly religious people who are good people who genuinely do love their country and they haven't vilified the rest of the world and they don't think the government should be a church. I mean, I do know those people. So I think it's important to be fair. Something just to chew on as we discuss these really complex things, you know. I've got Leonard. Leonard, thanks for calling. Hey, how you doing, sir? I'm excellent. What's happening? I just needed a little advice on how to articulate myself a little better when I'm um, talking to my daughters about this whole um, religious thing. Just a little background. I've actually um, ran across a couple of you and Matt Dillahunty's uh, videos last year, which piqued my interest and um, got to listening and listening and going back and studying and studying for myself or whatnot. And um, long story short, um, I've pretty much become a an atheist in the last year or so. And I've raised my daughters to be um, Christian, you know, or to grow up in a church family type structure. And now that I've came across this revelation or this news, you know, I kind of explained it to my daughters and let them know the path that I was going down. And, you know, um, they was very supportive and we always been very, very, very close. But just, about a half hour ago, actually, we um, got to discussing things as far as evolution and other things as far as the Bible or whatnot, and it got a little heated, and neither one of us really knew how to express how we felt, because as you can tell, I'm not as articulate as I would like to be, and I damn sure ain't no holy roller, you know, even when I believe, really didn't, you know, uh, not to make it a racial thing or nothing. But, you know, I'm, well, I'm a black guy. And um, even when I believe, it seemed like I really didn't give a damn. You know, I, I really didn't press it. All I really wanted to do was take care of my family or whatnot. And I just know, you know, ever since I've been studying or whatnot, I've really leaned to that side. And I just know, you know, after this big blow up we had, because it was pretty big. And it had me thinking about a lot of the uh, segments I heard, you know, with you and your family and your father or whatnot. And I just need uh, um, a little advice because I don't want to lose my daughters behind this whole God shit, you know? Yeah, I understand. May I ask how old they are? 19 and 22. Well, I'm not like a professional counselor or anything like that. I'm just, you and I are just talking like friends. Okay. You're talking to a guy who... I haven't deconverted or prompted to deconvert any single member of my religious family. Uh, when I first came out of the faith, I had this naive belief that all I had to do was show them all the crazy stuff that I had discovered in my own research and to demonstrate, you know, evolution and cosmology and the singularity and you know, this whole large world, amazing world reality beyond this sort of manufactured religious reality, and they would join me and we would all go off together and do a more reasonable future. And that just never happened. In fact, the opposite happened. Right. They doubled down. You probably saw this with your daughters, right? They felt kind of attacked yeah. and insulted. And before you know it, the voices are raised and everybody doubles down and, yes. you know, you're shouting over each other and... When it's over, you think, you know, oh, God, I should have just kept my freaking mouth shut. That kind of sounds like what happened. Exactly. Yeah. Right. My thinking is, if their formative years were religious years, and this was the foundation for their lives so far, that's, yeah, not, something, to me too. <laughs> that's not something that's going to be undone in a conversation. Secondly, we've addressed this on the show, the way beliefs are formed and protected. People protect beliefs that are tied to their identities. They protect that the way they would protect themselves from a physical threat. 
So your daughter's amygdalas fire up and they think uh, something that I cherish is under attack. So it's a fight or flight thing. Probably both. They probably fought with you and then they just left. Yeah. <laughs> and so f for me, I mean, there is no magic bullet. There is no perfect solution. I don't think you're going to be able to, at least right off the bat, reason your daughters into another world. But I do think that if there's any headway to be had, it's about making that journey about you. So as you speak to them, instead of saying, you've held on to a belief that I taught you and it's wrong and you need to understand what I'm thinking, you know, I think they might be more responsive yeah. if you're sitting down with no pretense, no raised voices. Do not raise your voice. Stay calm at all costs, even if you have to cut the conversation short. Do not get sucked in, which we all have, right? You get sucked in, and before you know it, right. you, you feel the vein on your forehead popping out, and you're like, God damn it, listen to what I'm saying, right? You find yourself, and then the, uh, <laughs> then it goes to hell, and you wish you'd never started. You've got to stay calm. But I would talk about your own journey. You know, it's funny, when I raised you, mm -hmm. I was really a true believer, and I really held to this and this. But, you know, I did some research. I found some resources that I found compelling. So in my own life, I've come to this realization. And I just want to be honest with you and let you know that I think I was wrong, and here's kind of why. Now, you're not using data points at this time you're not arguing a case you're not in the courtroom okay right you're just saying yeah just I, explaining where i'm coming yeah, from yeah i made a siege there has been a change in perspective that i think you know i think i've got some valid questions i love the word questions right i've got some some questions right. some things that don't add up for me and then i would tell them your journey belongs totally to you honestly if you believe in a god you have the right to do that. But if you ever want to have some conversations about some of the things that have troubled me, I would be interested, you know, and I want to listen to you and we could talk and listen to each other and there will be no judgment. And, you know, I just want to be understood and I want to make sure I understand you. This is the language, I think, that keeps people's defenses down. Mostly, we have to remember that right. people change their minds from a position of safety. Nobody, I'm convinced nobody will be attacked into reversing their position on a belief that is linked to their identity. And your daughters, you know, they are just right. now, they become adults, they're being introduced to the world, they're laying the foundation for their lives. I'd keep the conversations kind. Again, I'll be honest, I'm not the guy who's ever deconverted a member of his devout evangelical family, right? But I have become a little better at conversations, at understanding the psychology of ideas and beliefs, how to de-escalate whenever possible. There's a time to get good and pissed off and passionate and all those things. But I think in your situation, using language to keep them off the defensive and to Assure them that your journey is not an attack on them. I think that'll go a long way. I don't know. Does that make sense? Does that resonate at all with you? Oh uh, man, you uh, you you hit it on the you hit it on the head. You know, and uh, I just want to say I appreciate it. Well, let me Listen, let like me I throw one more thing out. I hate to interrupt, but I don't want to lose you before you take off. No, no, go ahead. You said that you don't feel comfortable articulating everything that's in your mind. Here's an exercise that I have done. Right. I, I did a lot, especially when I, I got in. Like, I'm in the business of communication. I've always been kind of a mouth anyway. But, but there were times when I'm like, I'm not sure how I want to say this. Or I get in the moment, and I don't want to get sidetracked. Or I don't want to stumble and look flaky, you know. And I would write it out. Right. Just in private. Not that you bring paper and pen into the conversation. But long before you ever have coffee with your daughters... You just kind of sit down and bullet point some things out, write it out. You, writing it out, typing it out, those types of things provide a chance to say it before you say it and see in black and white what some of the problems might be with it. And you know what? That's not a really good, that, that doesn't make a lot of sense. Let me look at that again. It's almost like you're honing things down. And then you can kind of look right. at it again from time to time. You can practice saying the words out loud from time to time rehearse it. I've done this driving in the car. I look like an idiot at the stoplight, but you know, I 
sometimes would do <laughs> situationals where I'm like, I need to walk into this conversation prepared enough so that I don't take the bait, I don't lose track, I don't let my emotions get the better of me, and I don't blow it. And the way we often do that, I think, is through practice. That's where I'd start. And, uh, you know, keep it light, keep it relatively short, and just remind them that you love them and respect them. That's about all I got, man, and I hope it helps, okay? Uh, man, I, I really appreciate it. Like I say, thanks a lot. And, you know, I, I gave you a call because, like I say, my daughters mean the world to me. We're very, very close. And I would hate for us to, you know, have a little distance due to a disagreement, especially hey, seeing today my world, you know? People are more important than beliefs, right? And I think if you remind your daughters... Whatever our disagreements may be here, you matter to me the most, and I love you with all my heart. Not, don't give them that condescending, that nauseating love that the pious like to toss out. <laughs> I love you with the love of the Lord kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, don't I reverse that. But hey, yeah. you know what? It's all good. You're safe with me. And you know, if let's get philosophical sometime and kind of talk some stuff out. I'm totally listening. And whatever happens at the end of the day, we're still family. And I think that's the best I got, okay? Oh, I really appreciate it, Seth. You're amazing. All right. Take care. Thank you. I always feel a little self conscious. Like, you know, I don't have a PhD in this stuff. I've had a lot of the conversations that he's talking about, but I haven't had a ton of success. Mostly what I know is what doesn't work. And I have learned what keeps things off the defensive so that at least the conversations are a bit more pleasant. And I'll give you a case in point. My mother called. I'm trying to, you know, have conversations with her. Just lost her husband, and I know she's readjusting to her life, and she's still my mother. But she's got some wackadoodle ideas about the world. She's like my father. It's very much an apocalypse narrative all the time. We're in the end times. She sees the devil everywhere. Lately, she's been seeing it in the Catholic Church. Now, we were always raised as Protestant Christians, to see the Catholics as just, you know, this wacky, culty, bogus flavor of Christianity. And, you know, they're all they're all totally misguided. They don't understand the Bible. They're Catholics, blah, blah, blah. You know, that was us. It's the way that these uh, denominations, even within Protestantism, sit around with their arms folded and judge the other denominations for being theologically incorrect. We did that with the Catholic Church. But mom... You know, she asked me a while back, she she uh, she said, hey, she sent me a text. She said, hey, have you been following the story about the Catholic Church and UFOs? And I'm thinking, oh, God, what do I even do with this? I said, wait, wait a minute, hang on. The Catholic Church and UFOs, I responded. Yeah, been reading those reports about the leaders of the Catholic Church communicating with UFOs? Okay, wait. Well, now the word communicating has come in. So my snark factor normally kicks in immediately. All right, hang on. Just all right. What? You got the Pope and the uh, higher elements of the Vatican. And what do they have? Transmitters. And they're in dialogue with, I, I know mom's thinking aliens, little green men. Okay. And don't even get me started on the whole UFO controversy that's been going on. You know, recently declassified footage shows UFOs are real. Hang on just a second. You means unidentified. Unidentified is in the name. We don't know what it is. They have not been identified. They certainly haven't been proven to be aliens. So... But if you are primed for magical thinking, if you're primed to live in an alternate reality, that's the kind of shit that you latch on to. So mom's like, well, you know, the Catholic Church, dun, 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 has been in contact with the aliens. There's nothing you can do with that. I said, okay, well, you know, no, I haven't followed that story, mom. Well, I've been doing a lot of Bible study about it. She said, oh, okay, all right. I mean, I, I could have jumped in. I could, But after a dozen plus years, nothing has come of it. Only shouts, only pain, only division, only frustration. 
my tactic was to just not engage. It's like that line from War Games, the only way to win is not to play. So that passed, and I got a call a couple of days ago. Hey, this is your mother. I was just calling to check in. Uh-huh, yeah, just calling to check in. My mother's not calling to check in. There's something on her mind. So I'm waiting for the bomb to drop. Five minutes after some small talk, she says, by the way, I have been engaged in some fascinating Bible study, and I have become amazed at how often... I have found references to flying saucers in the Bible. Now, I almost, I almost said, what the fuck are you talking about? (laughs) What the fuck are you talking about? But I didn't. I said, "Uh uh-huh, yeah, oh, the Bible has flying saucers? Well, too, and I've been researching Enoch. You know Enoch, yeah, I'm familiar with Enoch, yeah, yeah. It's fascinating how the Bible was able to uh, address these flying saucers. And you know, the book of Revelation, and without becoming snarky, I uh, said, well, you know, Mom, I mean, the book of Revelation's got some wacky stuff in it, you know, it's got pregnant women levitating in the clouds and it's got bowls full of curses and seven headed dragons. And I mean, you know, she's like, well, I, I just, I'm not trying to get into it. And I'm like, no, no, no. I mean, I totally kept it light. I'm just saying that mom, you know, the Bible has some, some really unusual stuff in it. You know, I mean, I, I haven't seen any articles about the seven headed dragons kind of thing, but when it could have become tense and it could have become awful again, I kept it light. I threw out just a tiny little morsel of challenge, but I did so without totally going after her. That has allowed us to have a flavor of communication and a kind of relationship, and that's really the best I've got. If we had tried this conversation five years ago, I would have nuked her from orbit, and we would have both been yelling at each other, and one of us might have hung up on the other. It was was that bad. It was that horrible. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to go off on a tangent. People were often, you know, they call me and they ask me because I'm in a point position here. They're like, how do I convince people that they believe in a fantasy? And I'm like, I don't think that is a realistic expectation. It's almost the equivalent of saying, how do I get somebody else to not be a drug addict? Uh, You know, good luck with that, right? I mean, you can provide encouragement express concern, communicate a path forward, provide a living example of the better way. But man, you just can't live their lives for them. Our listeners have more to say. It's kind of a potpourri of topics, a variety show of topics. We will continue with more of your calls next. Hang on. I do most of what I do online. And so I need fast and I need secure and I'm not a techie, so I need it not to make my eyes just glaze over when I'm trying to set it up and use it. For me, this means NordVPN. VPN stands for Virtual Private Network. Essentially, it's an encryption process. It protects your IP address, your online identity, right? In a world where keeping yourself and your files safe is super critical. And this application is perfect. It even makes public Wi-Fi hotspots safe. I don't know how many times I have been at an airport or a restaurant on the laptop or phone. It says, you are not secure on this network. No longer with NordVPN. I mean, I don't go online because I want to be tracked or hacked, and I don't have to sacrifice speed to be secure because NordVPN is the fastest VPN on the planet. Choose from over 5,200 servers in 59 different countries. You can protect multiple devices. 24-7 support if you happen to have any issues. I use it. You will love it. Go to NordVPN, that's N-O-R-D-V-P-N dot com slash Seth, or use my name as the code, Seth, to get a two-year plan plus a bonus gift with a huge discount. You get a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there is zero risk when you try it, and the ease and the speed and the peace of mind you get is just amazing. Go now to NordVPN dot com slash Seth. 
or just use the code SETH. You want the show early and you want a commercial free and you want to support me and my work? Thank you so much for becoming a patron at patreon.com slash Seth Andrews. Continuing a show that is really just about you and whatever you want to talk about. I've got Jonas. Jonas, thanks for calling. Are you with me? I am. Hello, Seth. First of all, my condolences. I, I also lost my father not so long ago. Very and, sorry. Um, and I want to thank you and Aaron and Matt because you have been my best friends for a long time. Wow. And you, you in particular have helped me sleep a lot. Wow. <laughs> I, I mean, uh, really? I love your voice. Oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, uh, I, I, my I, voice I, puts you to I, I, sleep. I, I, I'll take that I, as a compliment. No, 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 no. Not your arguments, man. That, those are great. I, I totally. I'm tracking. I'm just being a I, jerk. Go ahead. Go ahead, brother. What I mean is that I tend to turn on one of your broadcasts because I can't sleep at night, and you call me dying. Your voice calms me down. I'm a full uh, service host, man. Uh, you know, not only do we do atheist and humanist content here, but we're also doing some ASMR and relaxation techniques so that, you know, the audience can totally zone in Zen. And so for that, you are, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to be there. Glad to be there for you, brother. The thing is that I learn if I can't sleep. And if I sleep, I sleep well because your voice is soothing. <laughs> well, thanks so, for that. Well, what else on your mind? Well, I have this question. Because I'm Swedish, and Swedish is, from an American perspective, a very left-wing country. And it seems to me that you were a right-winger, and Matt Dillahunty was as well. I don't know about Arn, I don't think he was. But it seems to me that after you turned atheist, you turned left as well. Can you explain? Is that a misconception on my part? It is not. Is there something in, in losing the Christian religion that makes you go further to the left in politics as well? That's my question. In my own life, once I stepped out of religion, I found myself having to go back and determine what my values, not what my religion's values, but what my values were. And it, this was a process for me. It took a series of years. You know, a guy who was a Rush Limbaugh, Glenn Beck, Ann Coulter, Fox News Christian kind of guy, you know, hardcore right wing. My country, love it or leave it, we speak only English in America. Guns don't kill people, people kill people. I, I had literally simplified everything into these little conservative right wing bumper stickers. When I got out of the faith, I thought, well, what else? have I been wrong about? And what are my values now that I'm not standing on the Bible or waving the Bible around? And I had to go back point by point. And more and more, I realized that the humanistic approach to these were totally in contrast to what I previously believed. And so point by point, I ended up walking away. I actually wrote something about this on Facebook, which I took a lot of heat for. If I can answer your question off the air, I'll just read the piece to you. It's like, I don't know, 10 minutes long, 5, 10 minutes long. And maybe that will help clarify. Would that be all right, Jonas? Of course. Of course. Wonderful. Well, I do appreciate your call, and I appreciate you listening in Sweden, okay? Thank you very right. much, Seth, for Thank everything you. and for making me sleep well. <laughs> You're most welcome. You put me to sleep. I like it. I, I think it's a beautiful compliment. I wrote this, I said, I get a bit irritated at the question, which I heard again recently, what's the deal with the idea that atheism equals liberalism? I'll clear it up one more time. Atheism doesn't equal liberalism. Atheism is no guarantee of rationalism or reason or logic or skepticism or even basic human decency. Atheism is simply the non-belief in gods. However, for a great many of us, the realization that there are no gods managing our problems, there's no master plan, there's no manna from heaven, no cosmic justice, and no divine intervention means that we have refocused ourselves, realizing that humans are going to have to solve our own problems. 
equality, education, opportunity, charity, the alleviation of suffering, justice, kindness, inclusion, love and acceptance beyond tribal walls. This is humanism. And I'm sorry, but as much as hardline conservatives don't want to hear this, humanism leans heavily on liberal values. It's sure as shit a better universe than the Christian nationalist GOP, the Republican Party, the right-wingers. They're spinning theocratic privilege. They sowed the distrust of science and scientists. They blame the world's sins for the suffering on this planet. They're pissing on the constitutional state church line. They prop discrimination, LGBT discrimination, racial discrimination, whatever discrimination nation. They prop it up on the Bible. They form foreign policy based on apocalyptic narratives like Israel. And they operate in this constant state of frothing outrage over the mere notion of having to share the table with the rest of us. So beyond that, look at it objectively between the conservative and the liberal. Which philosophy, which philosophy is more inclined to give rights to minorities? to acknowledge racial discrimination and teach legitimate history to prevent future bigotry. Education? It's not the 21st century American conservative party, sorry. Science over superstition? (laughs) That's going to lean way liberal. To legalize recreational drugs in the wake of this always losing drug war. Who is protecting female reproductive choice? Who is embracing death with dignity issues and bodily autonomy? Who is fostering inclusivity of people with other faiths, other colors, other nationalities? Who opposes institutional executions, the death penalty, which is hugely problematically applied? And many of us feel like it's a human rights violation. It's barbaric. Who wants health care for everybody and thinks it's the responsibility of societies to take care of each other? Who more likely rejects all this hawkish war rhetoric by these you know, pounding general types? Who wants to remove religious language from the courts and the Congress and get it off the money? And all these representative institutions that were never designed to be churches. It's not the fucking Republican Party. It's leaning heavily liberal or progressive. I mean, uh, people already are typing their hate mail at me about all the problems with the, the liberals and the progressives and the Democratic Party. And you're right. There are massive, there are major problems. There are fringe elements. There are people who are totally wrongheaded. No tribe or group or cause or institution is flaw free, but it's not equal right? The the false equivalence argument for me just makes me crazy. Well, they're all equally bad. You got to be shitting me. The values that I'm interested in as a humanist are absolutely not, not the values of 21st century American conservatism. They're just not. Most of the time recently, it's just this zealous, myopic, insular, tribal, screw them, I've got mind, members only club. There are, in fact, and I will be the first to admit, there are many wonderful people who do have an R beside their name on the voting card. Okay? There are. And there are some liberals that won't even go there and they think all Republicans are Nazis. And that's just another example of how we on the left can get things wrong, be oversimplistic or too tribalistic or, you know, we try to other people to the point where they're not just in disagreement or wrong, but they are Nazis, right? They are the evil. But I really do think that the people who have that R by their name are just often, even the good people, have compartmentalized away this sort of Trumpy authoritarianism that's been going on. Many of them are single-issue voters, so it's taxation, they want small government, they're quote-unquote pro-life, whatever. I think they're good despite the R, not because of it. So no, atheists don't have liberal values, right? Atheists simply don't believe in God, doesn't require anything else about us. But I am increasingly convinced that humanists lean heavily into liberal values. And my rejection of gods informed my transition from being a theocrat into a humanist. As my friend Dale McGowan said so well, atheism for me was the first step. Humanism was the thousand steps that followed. Liam, thanks for calling. You with me? Yes, sir. What's on your mind? 
Oh, I'm just uh, thinking about aliens, and you kind of answered some of my questions already. Um, <laughs> I'll give you my I, mom's uh, phone number. I you guys can up... talk about aliens. That'll be a fun No, concept. no, 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 no. But I, I don't want to dismiss the concept too soon. I mean, I was brought up religious, and during those uh, early days, I don't think I would have had room in that framework for a whole other created species. I, I, don't, I think that would have been a non-starter. And for the past, say 15 years, I've been very comfortable in my atheism. And I'm also trying to not be dogmatically closed to the possibility that there could be other life. You know what I mean? Oh, you and I agree. I think the idea that there are hundreds of billions okay. of galaxies and there's no other life out there, I just think that's hugely problematic. Right. I just resist this notion right. that there are all these bulb-headed, big-eyed, flying saucer, <laughs> flying, you know, little green men kind of aliens. It's probably going to be bacteria and shit like that, or maybe something we can't even imagine or haven't yet, right? Right, and it, it is telling how, you know, how quickly people who are acclimated to magical thinking go from unexplained to anthropomorphizing and personifying that it must be men. Yeah. You know, maybe it's a probe or maybe it's, uh, you know, a glitch in the, the matrix, the simulation that we're living in. You know, maybe it's something bleeding over from one of these, uh, you know, other enfolded dimensions, the fifth dimension that the string theory people talk about. Maybe they're right, but no, they want to go straight for the little gray men. You know, what's interesting, too. I remember it wasn't it Ken Ham of Answers in Genesis who posted a few years back oh, gosh. that if aliens did exist, they would all be going to hell because Jesus had not died <laughs> for their sins. <laughs> I just thought to myself. Oh, no, wait a minute. That just made me remind me of something because, like, the one few thing that I have in common with my still very religious parents is that they're Star Trek fans. And that just reminded me that my, my mother had this sort of, like, gleam in her eye when she thought about I guess it was like the Vulcans that, that were very logical and had their stuff together that, that maybe they never fell from a state of grace. Maybe they didn't eat the apple. What if what if God yeah, created I, another Garden of Eden in another world? How arrogant of us to think that we got the only garden. What if God had an Adam and Eve elsewhere like Adam and Eve 2.0 and maybe that scenario mm -hmm. didn't fail. And what if it's going on right now? We just don't know about it. What if, what if, what if? So, yeah, I, I don't want to dismiss the concept too quickly because, you know, I, I can't pr disprove that there's aliens. But, you know, my opinion about it hasn't budged very far. It's gone from slim to none to just still pretty slim to none. But I think just as a concept, I've been listening to a lot of... Uh, podcasts in general and, and yours in particular during the pandemic. So I'm not just, you know, talking to m myself and the cat. And I'm a big fan of uh, Anthony Magna Bosco and his, his street epistemology. And I, I think that um, if somebody, if you have religious friends, that's getting difficult to talk about the real issues with, and they haven't formed a, an opinion about this, or if they have that, I think that this could be a valuable opportunity to talk to them and kind of unravel their epistemology. It's like, well, how did you form this opinion? You know, the Bible doesn't say aliens anywhere. If you think that it's in there, why does it spell it out better? Or if you don't think there's aliens, then why not? And you'll play devil's advocate for that and sort and see if you can tease into how they formed. Because everybody seems to have a strong opinion about this. Well, I genuinely do think that um, I think we're going to discover some form of life. The idea that we're it. You know, we're all that there is in the universe. I just, you know, I just don't buy that. I, But you're going to have to demonstrate to me that that life exists. And in the meantime, the rest is just theories, right? We're just, uh, we're guessing. Right. I have a background in chemistry, and so I'm a little shaky on biology, but I'm a non-dualist. I don't think that there's a soul or a spirit that animates your corpse walking around you know, I think it's a physical process. Uh, I have some kind of weird ideas about that. It would take a while to go into, but are justified by science. But I think it is a universal process that if there are hundreds of millions of planets out there with, with conditions very, very similar to Earth, I think there probably are microbes or something. But also everything I know about science, the uh, speed of light is that hard speed limit. You can't get around that. If there is intelligent life, it's probably died out 100 million years ago. And we'll probably not come to direct contact with it. I'll let the comment section chew on that one. I think it's a fun subject to talk about and to kind of delve into deeply and unpack people's belief without getting into that. 
I, I'm, I'm kind of surprised that your mother went straight to, I think there's evidence in the Bible. I'm not sure everybody would go there that quickly, but it's a fun time. All right. Well, th- thanks for calling. We'll see you later. Thanks for everything you do. Bye. Appreciate you. I uh, looked up the article about uh, Ken Ham. This was dated December 6, 2017. Creationist Ken Ham. This is in the Huffington Post. Creationist Ken Ham, who recently debated Bill Nye the Science Guy over the origins of the universe, is calling for an end to the search for extraterrestrial life because aliens probably don't exist, and if they do, they're going to hell anyway. You see, this is a quote, you see, the Bible makes it clear that Adam's sin affected the whole universe. Ham wrote in his blog on Sunday, this means that any aliens would also be affected by Adam's sin, but because they are not Adam's descendants, they can't have salvation. The post was driven in part by NASA experts saying they expect to find evidence of alien life within the next 20 years. It's highly improbable in the limitless vastness of the universe that we humans stand alone, NASA Administrator Charles Bolden said last week. But Ham, president and CEO of Answers in Genesis and the Creation Museum in Petersburg, Kentucky, said, We probably are alone. He wrote that Earth was specially created, and the entire hunt for extraterrestrials is really driven by man's rebellion against God in a desperate attempt to supposedly prove evolution. If aliens do exist, however, Ham said that even Jesus can't save them. There are so many things wrong with with all of this. (laughs) I'm sorry. Talk about the short end of the stick. Let's say it's little green men or whatever. They're living on planets, whatever. And something that happens in another solar system, hell, another galaxy, something totally outside of your realm happens. And because of that, you are damned to go to hell forever. There's no redemption scenario for you. Jesus isn't going to stop by and pay you a visit. There's going to be no blood atonement for you if you even have blood on your planet. No, no, you are destined to go to hell. I've got Kim. Hi, Kim. Thanks for calling. Hey, Seth. How are you doing today? Excellent. What's on your mind? I'm also on a journey of, I still go to church, and I'm still in that middle stage of what to believe. And I had sent one of your YouTube videos to my pastor, and of course, he didn't like that at all. And he's like, we need to have the discussion, sit down in person. So is there anything that you would advise me to say to him or because I just I'm in that point I grew up strict Southern Baptist I'm from Texas down by Houston so strict Southern Baptist like everybody's going to hell everybody's burning in hell that whole thing the challenge is that your pastor I would wager is not wanting to have a conversation with you in good faith to genuinely discuss the concerns you have this is an intervention all right. So the first thing he's going to do is he's going to discredit the witness. He's going to find a reason to say that, you know, Seth is a false prophet or he never knew Jesus, the no true Scotsman thing, or he's an agent of the deceiver who has come to whisper in your ear, blah, blah, blah. And my first thought is you don't owe your pastor a minute of your day. I mean, it, that your journey is not about right. him. You don't need to be validated by him. What he thinks, honestly, doesn't make a damn lick of difference. Your journey's about you. And you're not broken. You don't need to be fixed. You're on a journey. That's the most important thing. He's in intervention mode. He wants to go and try to fix you. And my thinking is, you ain't broken. I think you're doing it right. And you deserve an honest life. So and if you want to sit down and hash it out, knock yourself out. But your journey really starts and ends with you. Make it about you. Start from there and everything else. You know, they want to be a guest in your living room. You get to decide who you open your door to. Fair enough? Fair enough. Sounds good, Seth. Thank you so much. All right. Good luck in your journey. All my best. Thank you. I like the language of that. We're on a journey. We're all on a journey. Life's a journey. Sounds like a freaking country song, but... 
mean, there is a beginning and an end, and there's a long road in between. And uh, there are a lot of people, certainly religious people, who they've got this sort of established road, and they put up the guardrails, and they say, you got to be here, you got to walk this line, or else. And the rest of us are like, well, maybe I'm going to take my own journey. Maybe I want to explore. Maybe I think we should see what else is out here. I'm going to map out the things that I see and learn and collect some evidence and get a lay of the land and try to see things for what they are. Everybody else has a fit and they say, no, you can't do that. Well, who made that rule? Oh, look, they did. We just don't have to play by those rules. We get to be on our own journey. I just like the language of it. Jamie, thank you so much for calling the show. Are you with me? Yes, I'm here. So I guess I, um, I read your book, Deconverted, many years ago. I went through my journey probably around 2010 to 11. And growing up in Tulsa, and I listened to you at KXOJ many, oh, many years ago. You listened to me when I was a Christian <laughs> radio host? No freaking way. Yeah, yeah, KXOJ. Yeah, I actually think I like won a poster. I was like like the seventh caller or something. It was like a Petra poster or wow. something. Um, wow. uh, then. But anyway... I found that, you know, I wanted to sign off on, on my beliefs myself. I wanted to be a genuine me rather than being raised and being a product of what my parents wanted me to think. I wanted to, I, I had to first, I, I believe it's Descartes. It says, if you, if you want to believe things, you have to first disconnect from them and then go down the list and sign off on each individual thing and say, yeah, I believe that. I believe that. And so I just went on this journey, and, and Christianity was the top of the list. And what I found after scrutinizing it, I came away being an atheist. And then I just had so many frustrations and anger issues, you know, because I just felt like I've been deceived. Here I was, 35 years old, and I was like, I don't, my worldview completely shifted and changed. Then I just found all kinds of issues with it, but I just really appreciate your book. It really held my hand in a sense and, and guided me down that path and helped me ask a lot of these difficult questions and find issues like the lotto of birth and, and the concept of hell and the concept of free will. Like, do we actually believe what we want to believe in or does, does it have to make sense to us? You know, we can't really sign off on our beliefs and say that it's simply a matter of will. I believe what I believe simply because I want to, because it would be nice to believe in Santa Claus, <laughs> but reality says I can't believe in that. And so what people don't under understand is to judge anyone based on what they believe in is just so grossly unjust because circumstances that we have no control over and life experiences that we also have no control over dictate to us what we believe in. And so if you're going to reward somebody based on their beliefs, that is really an unjust system. And so do I know more than God? Is he, is he not aware of this, this serious flaw? <laughs> it's a point that a lot of people miss, and I missed it when I was in the faith. Believers are commanded to believe. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the right. dead. And that's not how belief works. If I say to someone, I want you to stop believing in gravity— or believe that you can fly. They don't determine right. that they really believe or disbelieve. They can profess to believe or disbelieve. I don't think we can command someone to believe something because that belief is already deep-seated. Yeah. And you make a great point that I think a lot of people miss. But why must we believe anything? Because if you're admitting to having to believe something, then you're, you're admitting to not knowing it. I mean, why must we believe anything? Why can't I just, okay, if, you, if you're saying you don't believe something, well, you don't know, then why are you believing it? It's kind of contradictory. I you believe know? you have a point, my friend. I'm just, I just wanted to say it that way. I believe you have a point. I, I just don't understand why that seems to be so paramount, like why we must believe something. It's a lot of it, I think, you know? speaks to the fact that religions, fundy religions, are faith cultures. Fake it till you make it, belief over knowledge. Mm -hmm. And that... Right. That's a get-out-of-jail-free card or a get-out-of-proof-free card. Dr. Daniel Dennett, the philosopher, <laughs> likes to call it belief in belief. And, you know, so that's why people of faith, you know, mm -hmm. we see this on the advertisements for politicians every election season. You know, he's a man of faith. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, right. faith is professing to know what you don't know. So let's rephrase that. He's a man who professes to know what he does not know. It doesn't sound as good when you say it that way. <laughs> but uh, I think if, right. if you sell right. 
the idea of allegiance. Belief is primary. Knowledge, uh, don't trust your brain. Mm -hmm. Certainly don't trust those scientists who are using evidence. Right. You know, I, I think it's a lot easier right. for religions to insulate themselves from challenge and criticism. Exactly. And doesn't Christianity say, like, doubt is the sign of the devil or something like that? And shouldn't that be like a glaring red flag that if doubt is not allowed, then it's because it can't withstand the scrutiny? Wise words, my friend. Something to chew on. Yeah. I appreciate your call very much. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, well, awesome. Thanks a lot. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. He had mentioned a uh, 17th century a mathematician, Descartes. Rene Descartes has a great quote. He once said, if you would be a real seeker after truth, it is necessary that at least once in your life you doubt as far as possible all things. That seems like a good stopping place, don't you think? Thank you so much for listening. Thanks to all of our callers. Take care of yourself. Be safe. I'll see you next week. Follow The Thinking Atheist on Facebook and Twitter. For a complete archive of podcasts and videos, products like mugs and t-shirts featuring the Thinking Atheist logo, links to atheist pages and resources, and details on upcoming free thought events and conventions, log on to our website, thethinkingatheist.com.